So is this on? I guess yes. Is, that is it too loud? Is that too loud? <laughs> uh, thank you guys. Thanks, Rob. Thank you all for having me. Um, it's a real pleasure, and it's uh, very different uh, than our small little uh, uh, lab group of folks who are interested in uh, things like this at UC Davis. So it's a real treat to be down here. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to be presenting my uh, dissertation research. Uh, and my dissertation research is in South India, uh, as you may have read. And um, yeah, we'll just dive right in. So uh, I focus on sustainability. Um, I've been interested in uh, how human institutions interact with the environment in, in the long term. And I'm interested in these sorts of questions because I think we can address them. And I think they are addressable. And I think that we can use science to understand uh, what makes a sustainable uh, society. Uh, I think we're a long way from being able to define that, but I think we can make progress. Um, in particular, there are uh, very clear ways to define economic sustainability. Um, it's very clear when something is financially solvent and uh, sustainable. And there are uh, pretty decent ways to define ecological sustainability. But when it comes to defining what is culturally sustainable, uh, we're not there yet. We, we, haven't, we don't have a de definition for that uh, in multiple ways. And so I'm interested in, in helping to pursue um, uh, the science that will help us get in that direction. And I think uh, an important aspect of that is cooperation. Um, cooperation underlies economic and, and social uh, fabrics of society and um, is generally important. <laughs> so uh, my context is India. Um, of course, cooperation is important in, in every aspect of life. But when we think about India, of course, the first thing that, that comes to mind is some of the uh, ethnography and the, the social research and, and ideas about uh, society in India um, that have been there for a very long time. Uh, and some of the, uh, of course, the, the most important thing that people think about when they think about uh, what is society in India is caste. And they think about uh, hierarchy. And, um, and I, I think that that's important. And it, it uh, is an ongoing question. Uh, what is the nature of, um, uh, of how humans relate to hierarchy within societies? Uh, and, and what are the things that, that control it? Um, and so that's interesting. But my research question going into India is not about hierarchy. Uh, instead, uh, I'm interested in addressing some of the um, literature on ethnic diversity. And so uh, you may be familiar with some of this literature. Uh, a large amount of it suggests that um, ethnic diversity in a whole broad range of contexts, uh, developing world, developed world, um, cities, uh, rural areas, um, uh, all sorts of different contexts, has a negative effect on the provision of public goods. Um, and so I'm interested in understanding that, and I would like to apply uh, those, that sort of question to uh, ecological management. Um, uh, because uh, we don't really know yet if cooperative uh, groups are more likely um, to conserve their environment. Uh, and I think that's obviously a, a very important question to start to ask as we uh, try to plumb what it means to create a sustainable society. So uh, I put caste there in parentheses to remind myself uh, to uh, uh, put a little caveat here, and that it, some people would uh, criticize me for uh, equating caste with, uh, with ethnicity. And um, I think that. I think that uh, caste and ethnicity are actually very related, um, but I think that uh, uh, it's a, there's a little bit of nuance to it. I'd be happy to discuss it uh, with anyone who, who would like to, but for now, I'm just going to be calling caste diversity ethnic diversity. And I'm interested in the influence of it uh, on environmental management. So um, I did my research here in South India in the Polony Hills, uh, which is a little spit of uh, mountains that uh, stick out from the Western Ghats uh, into Tamil Nadu there. Um, and uh, at around 7,000 uh, feet, um, I worked in a bunch of villages uh, spread across that plateau um, uh, over the last two years. And um, I employed a bunch of different uh, 
uh, standard tools, surveys, and ethnography, and experimental games. Um, and I'm, what I'm going to be focusing on here today, I'm going to give you uh, some of the sort of uh, general background from the ethnography. I'm, I'm going to be giving you uh, the details and the very precise analysis from the experimental games. The survey uh, has yet to really be analyzed, and so we're going to be skipping over that. Um, first, uh, let me talk to you about uh, just what I learned uh, by hanging out and trying to ask uh, questions about how people uh, interact with resource management in general. Um, and even before that, let's get into sort of what the, uh, how these villages were settled and, and the like. So these villages were settled um, as agricultural villages for the first time some, somewhere around 400 years ago. And they were settled by a group of uh, people, a caste a group of people from uh, the plains, from the Pandian kingdom, which was in Madurai. Uh, and they came up, and the name of this group is the Manadiar. And uh, they settled agricultural villages, and in so doing, uh, sort of uh, uh, partly incorporated some of the uh, tribal people in the area into agricultural serfdom, um, and uh, as well brought uh, some other castes with them, uh, particularly um, uh, the Sakliar. Uh, now, um, so, well, since that time, 400 years ago, uh, other groups have been coming in. Uh, and these villages are actually quite diverse, uh, with uh, caste groups from all over um, South India. Uh, but they all speak Tamil, um, and um, they're all, uh, everyone survives by uh, farming and uh, sending their vegetables to the plains for sale. Here, though, uh, I want to focus on, uh, these are two individuals of the, the two most important castes in this study. Uh, the man uh, on the inside here, the bottom, uh, is a Manadiar, and uh, the man at the door uh, is a Sakliar. So he is uh, what they would call an untouchable. Uh, he's, so he's a member uh, in Government of India uh, uh, terminology. He's a scheduled caste. Um, and so that means that uh, people of his, of his denomination are given uh, particular uh, affirmative action uh, style benefits. Um, although there are a lot of them, and uh, life is still quite hard. So in particular here, uh, he's not allowed to enter the house <coughs> of this Manadiar because uh, so doing uh, would pollute the house. Um, so I just stress that because these are the groups that have been in these villages for the longest amount of time. Um, so here we are. Uh, now, the uh, any individual village, I worked in a whole bunch of villages, and some of them have uh, well, between three and 13 different uh, castes. So these are uh, endogamous groups. Um, but looking at now at the institutions, the institution that was most, um, most amenable to study was the irrigation institution, which in this case is called the Nirnikam system. And this Nirnikam irrigation system uh, seems to be very related to the irrigation systems that are all over Tamil Nadu, uh, and quite likely came <coughs> with the Manadiar when they came up. Uh, in addition, uh, so did, it seems, uh, the village council, which here is called the Podukutam, which means a common crowd. And um, the two of these institutions, which are the two that I focused on, uh, are interrelated. Um, and not only are they interrelated, but they have a special relationship to the uh, to the nature of the caste system uh, in this area, and, and to the interactions between the Manadiar and uh, the scheduled castes. So first let me tell you a little bit about the, the Podukutam. Um, uh, it's, a, it's an unofficial uh, village uh, decision-making uh, institution. And uh, in fact, not only is it unofficial, it's a, a non-governmental, but um, it's, uh, it's pretty endangered now. Um, because uh, the government of India instituted uh, the panchayat system, um, which uh, is very strongly competing with uh, the ability of the Podukutam and the traditional leaders to uh, actually have hold sway. Um, so that's interesting. In fact, uh, I've, in part of this work, I've collected a lot of stories about how um, the ability for, uh, for the, the headmen of the village, the Talibar, to actually uh, uh, function as um, really sort of the, the whole justice system themselves uh, was compromised by police who come in and say, no, uh, we're in charge. You don't decide. Um, 
and so and so we've had these uh, these are broken up by police uh, now and again. Um, nonetheless, they still are working uh, for now uh, in some of the villages, and um, uh, they're they're entirely male. Um, and uh, the amount of uh, the, so what happens in a potipotum is uh, village affairs are dealt with, uh, festivals are organized, funds are collected, village projects are organized, um, and uh, conflicts between uh, families between individuals in in um, the village and a whole as a whole are uh, are handled, um, and even conflicts between villages can be handled uh, if uh, the villagers will. Uh, come together, and um, the headmen from two different villages can come together and uh, <coughs> sort of hold a special session. So, but I want to give you a little bit of an idea about how uh, what the caste system looks like in terms of both uh, sort of diversity and hierarchy here. Um, so we have the the hereditary rulers are the manadiar, um, and uh, you know I'd like to actually stress one more thing here: the manadiar. Uh, not only are the hereditary rulers uh, and, and settled the villages, but the name of the, of the position uh, for the main leader, the main headman in the village, is manadiar. And so there are two different terms. One is the position, and the other is the caste. And traditionally, you'll have someone from the caste in the position, but in some villages, you'll have someone from a different caste in the manadiar position. So it's just uh, a really interesting uh, and obviously telling um, uh, facet about uh, <coughs> institutionalization of power. So, um, so here we have uh, my take on <coughs> how how power is actually sort of distributed among the castes. Here we have the, the scheduled castes at the bottom, uh, and Manadi are at the top. And then over time, these other castes have come in, and now they have not been untouchable, and they have not been. Uh, the leaders, and so as a result, they kind of occupy this default middle zone uh, with some spread. But the fact of the matter is, they are neither here nor there. And so, uh, the crudest of, of possible categorizations is to break it up into three different uh, levels. Um, and it, importantly, the castes that have come in in the last uh, you know couple of hundred years have no strong uh, power relationship relative to each other. Uh, in comparison to the existing one that's already there. So coming back to these two gentlemen, the man here uh, inside not only is a Manadiar, but also is the Manadiar uh, of this village. Um, and the man outside here is a scheduled caste man, and he is an employee of the town, and he's the village crier. Um, and uh, it's his job to uh, do a number of different village functions, but one of them is collect everyone when there's a village meeting. Um, and the interesting thing about that is when there are village meetings, uh, no one of his caste uh, is allowed to participate, and they're not represented. So um, so that is the background. I give you that because it, it, it integrates with the Nirnikum irrigation system, <clears throat> uh, around which I, I uh, focus the survey. Um, and the irrigation system um, works like a lot of irrigation systems. Water is collected from mountain streams. Uh, it's channeled into um, man-made ponds uh, from which it is distributed through channels uh, and then subdivided uh, through smaller channels to the fields uh, where farmers manage it within their own fields and within their own cells uh, so that we can grow crops. And this is the case all over these hills. Uh, but it creates a massive network of channels to be maintained. And farmers are responsible for part of that, uh, but it's too big to simply have farmers be responsible for it. Um, so as a result, we have individuals like this man, Mr. Dharma Lingam, and he's a Nirnikam, uh, and he's appointed by the village, and he oversees the channels, he makes sure they are clean, he makes sure they work, he makes sure that water is distributed uh, to people as it should be, as, it, as has been agreed on, and um, he also is responsible for overseeing disputes between farmers. And I actually saw him uh, oversee a dispute between farmers, and uh, he, did, he did it pretty well, but a part of the issue is that he is uh, a member of the SC community, and so it's hard for him to adjudicate uh, when there are folks uh, of much higher uh, uh, power uh, status in the village. 
and although I was never able to to see that uh, directly, it's uh, clear from what everyone is telling me that that, that is uh, difficult. So here he is cleaning uh, and maintaining the channels. So I took uh, these two institutions and I, I uh, conducted a survey, um, and the survey focused on both how cooperation uh, interacted with the bounds of uh, caste um, and whether caste diversity or caste hierarchy uh, had a strong effect, oh, I'm sorry, whether caste diversity itself, uh, not hierarchy, had a strong effect on um, the cooperation within these realms. And I'm not going to tell you about it. Um, but I'm going to tell you about what I thought uh, from it. And, and that is that uh, it seems very clear that uh, the ethnic boundaries of caste have a strong and, and negative impact on the quality of life. In particular, uh, it's magnified by caste status, of course. Um, and so, and this happens in, in the economic sphere, uh, it happens um, within the agricultural uh, labor exchanges in the fields, um, and it happens also within the social realm, um, uh, uh, the less formal, uh, less monetized uh, interactions. Um, but that's the survey. So hierarchy uh, seemed implicated, and so I came into it trying to uh, look at the influence of caste diversity, and, and, um, and now I, obviously I'm coming around full circle to say, okay, well, I'm in India, I'm going to have to deal with this. And uh, the question then becomes, uh, how am I going to deal with it? Um, so uh, thanks to the encouragement of uh, one of my mentors in uh, Bangalore, um, uh, uh, Sharad Lele uh, at Atri, he suggested, look, why don't you just measure both? Um, diverse, the influence of diversity and the influence of hierarchy. Um, and I think that that was actually a great idea, and I'm very thankful to him for it. Um, but the key is, how can you do that? In order to do that, you need, first you need a society where you have both, and of course I'm in one. Um, but then you need a way to compare them uh, legitimately uh, with a measure which is uh, comparable. Um, and so for that, uh, the public goods game works very well. Um, and, uh, and of course, in addition to the public, to it working well for this uh, uh, situation, it's also something that's used a lot. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen the public goods game, I'll, I'll go through it uh, briefly. You have a number of players, and they're given an endowment, um, and then uh, they are uh, instructed that there's a, a public investment mechanism uh, into which they can contribute money. Uh, and if they do, that money will grow. In this case, it will double. Uh, and then get distributed evenly back to the players. Uh, this leads us, of course, because it's distributed evenly, it creates the possibility that uh, individual players can shirk, uh, can put in less money, uh, but still get the same even return, um, and therefore uh, benefit more greatly than everyone else by free riding. So this creates uh, a useful tool to measure uh, exactly how people um, uh, are how, how interested they are in cooperating with the other people who we've selected uh, for them to play the game with, uh, or the other cues, or, or what have you. Uh, so I use the public goods game to imitate the irrigation system, which is the heart of the agricultural system, which is how the, these folks make their living. And <coughs> I really think here, in particular, it has a, a, a very strong connection to the way they live their lives on a daily basis. Uh, this is another great example of a, a cooperative uh, part of the, the irrigation system. These, these men are not Nirnikam folks, although the Nirnikam is at this meeting. They're meeting right above the pond, um, and they're deciding about tomorrow's uh, water distribution. Uh, and it's actually, this particular meeting was, was so loud uh, and um, argumentative that I, I had a hard time being there because I felt strongly like I was intruding on this. They didn't care. Um, but um, so these things are decided how much water, who gets it first, how long. Um, so, in a very real sense, we're dealing with uh, you know, cooperative problems um, where there is a limited amount of resource and it has to be distributed. Uh, and so, the public goods game is a naturalistic uh, tool to use in this case. So, now the question is how do I take? Um, the public goods game and measure both hierarchy and diversity in a way that, that makes sense. 
the nice part, of course, about being here, as I've stressed before, is that we have aspects of diversity and aspects of hierarchy within the, the castes and the way they are arranged, just because of sort of historical accident um, in this area. So by selecting people from different caste groups, I can create homogenous, um, uh, diverse, uh, or uh, hierarchical, or homogenous, or diverse and hierarchical conditions. Um, so it's worth pointing out that in the diverse case, I have two members of three different middle castes. And in the hierarchical case, I have three scheduled castes and three high caste members. OK. And the rest is apparent. Um, and of course, we're interested in these two. Uh, most are interested in the whole, the whole thing. So this is the village uh, where we did our research. And um, uh, what we used uh, for this is a, a web-based uh, data collection engine and some uh, handhelds and a laptop, a wireless network, um, which makes it very quick and easy. And I recommend anyone who is considering doing uh, behavioral experiments in the field use something like this. It makes data collection a dream. Um, I was able to collect uh, the majority of my data in under a month. Um, and uh, this was great. I'm going to be presenting these methods uh, tomorrow uh, at uh, CSU Fullerton at their web workshop. Um, and it's open source software developed by uh, Richard McElwraith at Davis. So you can get it if anyone's interested in, um, in getting copies of that or um, being involved in that. I can help you. So here we are. Uh, this is the room. And you can see I, I built these uh, plywood dividers so that uh, players would be isolated from each other. And, uh, there's the hardware. Um, I had about seven. I had seven uh, research assistants helping me, uh, and each research assistant uh, simultaneously attended to two different individuals in different booths. Uh, they are not playing the same game. They're playing different games, um, but they're playing the same sort of game. Um, and there is a, a, a handheld device for each uh, participant. Oh, finally, um, the individuals, in order to communicate their share and uh, how much they were interested in, in contributing, would use their, their fingers so that uh, communication was as quiet as possible. Um, but then, ultimately, uh, the research assistants would uh, read back the information from the previous rounds to each participant. So, And at the end, they'd stand up, and we would uh, sort them into the groups that they were actually playing in. Um, and then we would uh, ask them uh, if they were related to any of these people, uh, how much they knew them, uh, and things like this, collect a bunch of other data, uh, and then pay them uh, and let them go. And on average, they were very happy. Well, they were all very happy to, uh, to take part because uh, for uh, you know, an hour or less of their time, they got about a day's wage. Um, so that's the public goods game uh, that I conducted. And, um, I'm going to tell you now about the results. And some of you may have seen uh, a draft of the paper. Uh, I apologize for the quality of that draft. It's like um, it's not just hot off the presses. It's kind of like ripped out of the middle of the printing press. Um, and so that, that's, uh, that's my caveat for that. Uh, so the way I analyzed the public goods game um, is a way that I haven't seen anyone else uh, analyze it explicitly. And that is. Uh, I focused on three different, yeah, Dan. Just before you get to that, yeah. the framing of the game, so you mentioned that it directly parallels their irrigation system. Did you okay. use neutral language, or did you explicitly compare it to something like that? Thank you. I forgot to mention that. I explicitly compared it. And I said, uh, I said, you know, imagine that you are uh, doing, uh, this is about irrigation, uh, and this is the game. Um, and so after having the verbal explanation and, and the cueing in that, then I went through and I, um, everyone had to answer a questionnaire about the mechanics of the game, a pretty uh, complex and detailed one that involved math. Uh, and we recorded how, how many mistakes people made on that uh, as well. But yes, so that's the frame. Uh, there's one more thing I forgot to mention about the methodology, too. Uh, sorry. Uh, and that is uh, that is that after so after the game uh, I'm sorry after the the initial questionnaire uh, where I tested them then they played a practice game 
Uh, and then after that, I, I explicitly walked up and down and uh, made sure to announce the casts of everyone who was playing. So the casts are very much, much more than the irrigation system. Uh, the cast uh, composition is a very salient feature uh, in their play. Um, and Kartik, did you have a question? I was about to, how they knew about the cast. Yeah, okay. Um, thanks for reminding me on that. So uh, then, so I broke this down into three different aspects of cooperation. Uh, so starting from the bottom, you can look at the total uh, amount of uh, cooperation that any individual does over the course of the whole time they're there. Um, and that is dependent on both uh, where they start, uh, what their expectation uh, of how cooperative this little institution they're, they're now joining is going to be, and therefore how much they're willing to invest in it, and then the ongoing uh, round by round decisions that they make as, as time goes on. So I broke it up that way, and um, which, I, which as far as I know is, is new, uh, although I'd love to have other examples if anyone knows of them. Um, so the, uh, this is what the, like any public goods game, um, almost anywhere, uh, contributions decline over time. Um, but focusing first on the initial uh, contributions. Uh, these are, I think, a really important behavioral measure because they measure what people are expecting from everyone else before they know what really to expect from everyone else. And so that sets the stage because everyone has to make a guess about how cooperative <coughs> is going to be. And that guess uh, sets the starting point for this declining. Um, yeah. So they played the practice game. They played the practice yeah. They know what happened in the practice game? Yes. So am I wrong in thinking that the, so they played, it looks like four or five, four rounds of practice that the, yes, their right. expectations are what happened in the last round of the practice game? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. So that's, that's, yes. so it's really not a, then it's not really a, a you know, this is the, prior about what they, they have some experience already. Well, not this is the real prior. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, so the way, uh, there, and there are different ways to analyze it effectively. Uh, it doesn't matter how I analyze it, whether I, whether I take this or that, or I take both, uh, they all come out the same way. Um, and the interesting thing is, uh, I, I very clearly announced the uh, cast composition, and I announced it at this point, just before this point, right, in between the two games. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the people there didn't know the cast composition. In fact, I would guess in almost every single case, they knew it. Uh, they knew uh, all of the casts that were possible to play with, and so they were making some sort of uh, estimation about that up here as well. Uh, it's the same groups in the practice game and the real game. So the yes. pair is the same or a pair. Uh, That's right. They're putting groups of the same five people. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Um, what are those bars represent? Those are, uh, so, oh, I didn't have it here. Sorry, 95% um, confidence intervals. Okay, so were there people who were at zero across the board? Uh, not across the board, but there are a lot of people, there, there are a good number of people who, you know, flirted with zero a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. What else about methodology? How much was the endowment? Hmm? The endowment? Oh, thank you, yes. Uh, so. So the endowment is 10 rupees. Uh, I give them 10 rupees uh, every round. Uh, that's about a quarter. Uh, uh, and so then they get to decide how much out of that 10 they contribute each round. They keep the remainder. They get the share back. They components. Um, and so people left with between 200 and, and uh, 80 uh, rupees, usually. So, but we're focused on this, this first play, this first move. It's particularly important. And um, so what I did was, uh, for, for a lot of this, um, model comparisons. And so I apologize, it's a totally unreadable slide. Um, uh, but this is Richard's fault. Yes. Um, <laughs> I can see Richard lurking with you. You certainly can. Um, and so we have, um, so I, I, I created a bunch of models uh, that have different variables. And um, these are all of the, the variables that are interactions and treatment effects. And I've left out, just because of space, I've left out the, the controlling variables. But they're in all of the models. Um, 
and they're all they're all important. Uh, and I can talk about those controlling variables later, but it's in the paper. The interesting thing, though, with regards to the questions we're asking, is that the influence of the number of casts on cooperation is consistently negative. Now, you'll notice, though, that the, the number of casts, that's not my treatment condition for diversity. My treatment condition was three different little casts, right? So the number of casts seems to be a negative effect. However, if you look at the influence of whether or not a middle cast person, or rather in this case at minimum two middle cast people were in the game, it's a positive influence. Um, so that is to say, if I were to just naively not count the number of casts and just count my treatment conditions, I would say that the influence of um, diversity is positive. Uh, if I were to count the number of casts and include that, uh, then it's negative. Um, so which is to say that uh, there's a complicated thing going on here, uh, and I'm going to take a little bit more time to explain it in the next... Uh, Before you move on, can you tell us what those numbers are? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <clears throat> sorry, these are, these are uh, simply estimates, and these are linear model estimates for that particular... And I, I'm sorry, I don't have the uh, standard errors included these here either. These are or just... These are So they're standardized regression numbers? Yes. Okay. So you? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay. Uh, so, the real effect of diversity seems to be negative. Um, but I put those question marks there because the only place you can find real diversity in this society is if you are in the middle castes. So the question comes, why are they, uh, why is the effect of being a middle caste so strong and so positive? Um, so that is a... Uh, so there's caveat with diversity. With hierarchy, however, um, it's very clear. What we have here is that uh, hierarchy is negative uh, in, in all cases, except when you include the interaction with caste stratum. And the interaction with caste stratum is always negative. And what that means is uh, higher caste people decline or reduce their cooperation vastly more than low caste individuals. In fact, low caste individuals start with a very low amount of cooperation when they play within a group of only their own caste. High caste individuals cooperate a lot when they're in a homogenous group. You combine high caste and low caste people, and the high caste drop their cooperation level down to the level of the low castes. So the biggest effect of hierarchy, the greatest damage, is the dis this decline in cooperation from the high caste. So finally, we'll look at the, um, the total amount of uh, cooperation over the course of the uh, game. And this is just a, a <coughs> binomial regression. And here we have, um, oh, sorry, we have two things. So hierarchy and the number of castes. They both have negative effects, but hierarchy is much stronger. Uh, however, when we take out the effect of middle castes, the number, the, the strength of diversity, uh, the negative strength of diversity increases significantly. If you can see that, it goes from, so we have 0.04 and then we go up to, to now, 0.19. Um, so why do you think the betas are so much smaller here than they are? Well, this, uh, because this is binomial and the other one was linear. Yeah. And so they're all small. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. The third um, aspect, Sarah. Um, are the lower class individuals increasing their cooperation when they're in these heterogeneous groups with the higher class compared to? No, they the decrease class? it slightly. They, they, they decrease. So they both decrease. It's just that the higher class decreases. Decrease a lot more. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So the last aspect is how do you get from the expectation of how cooperative this is going to be? To the total, the final output. Um, now these are uh, the change over time. Uh, this is uh, Indian rupees. This is change in Indian rupees from from my contribution in one round to my contribution in the next round. Okay, and as you can see, they're almost all negative, right? So this just means that cooperation declines over time. Um, so how does this uh, stack up? The interesting thing that you'll see in my model uh, selection exercises is that the top-ranked model has no 
influence doesn't even include the very any of the treatment variables. None of the social um, uh, 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 variables come into play in, at all. So we have so no social composition, not hierarchy, not diversity, nothing. Um, so that's interesting because I was actually imagining that this was the sort of cue that if I was a uh, a lower caste individual, I would be constantly aware that there was a high caste individual there with me, or vice versa. And that would be affecting my round by round decisions. In this case, I have no evidence that that's the case. Rather, all of the uh, explanatory power here uh, comes from simply the economic feedback from individuals in the last round, um, as well as their relationship, uh, whether or not they were related to them, and whether or not they had heard about the game before playing. So essentially, there is nothing here um, for the influence of social composition. Could you go back? What, so yeah. what is weight? That's the, uh, so this is the AIC okay, weight. weight. Yeah, AIC weight. There's the AIC value itself. And actually, what happens, um, the reason this is, this is that you can see what happens as you add more variables, the degrees of freedom go up. And so they get penalized. So the, um, the simplest model is the model that only includes my uh, control variables, and that's it. Another way to look at this is just uh, with some model weighted averages. But basically, what you can see is that the control variables are strong and that the treatment variables and interactions with the treatment variables are very weak. So, what does this mean? Um, I think really uh, it's clear in terms, of, in terms of diversity and hierarchy, diversity damages cooperation um, given what we've seen. However, I want to put a caveat on that, and that is the issue with the middle casts. So the middle castes themselves are relatively highly cooperative. They're more highly cooperative than are the uh, lower castes. Uh, uh, and they're a little bit less cooperative in, uh, than are the high castes, although I didn't measure them in homogeneous groups. So one of the things that happens is if you compare the hierarchical case, where you have high castes and low castes, to the case where you have high and middle and low castes, the high caste individuals increase their competition, they increase their cooperation when middle castes come in. And why is that? Um, we can speculate about that, but that's, that's the point. Um, I think uh, it's important, obviously, here to dis just distinguish between the influence of those other castes. Uh, yeah. So is that the result of uh, the high caste members uh, changing their behavior over the course of the game because the middle caste members are contributing more, or do they even start off? Starting. Yeah. Starting. Um, yeah. In fact, the entire for the whole game, this this thing holds true. So we have very strong uh, effects of negative effect of hierarchy, um, and. Uh, a questionable but still st certainly strong um, negative influence of diversity. However, uh, the thing that, that caught me completely off guard uh, relates to your point, Sarah, and that is that um, the expectations of cooperation determine how people cooperate on the first round. And the first round determines how high they start, which determines sort of the social momentum. The social momentum, therefore, adds up over time and determines the total outcome amount of cooperation. So effectively, and this is a really important, I think, methodological point, uh, all I needed to do was measure the first round cooperation. Uh, I didn't need to spend you know, 14 more rounds um, uh, really uh, measuring uh, how people are cooperating, because it, doesn't, it didn't matter. Uh, after that got set up, the, uh, the ball got the ball rolling, the ball just rolls as far as it can go, and that's it. Um, this, I think, is actually a really important uh, uh, point. And first of all, it could be used uh, you know, for methodological advances, but I think it's also an important social point. And that is that first impressions make a huge difference here. Um, and that, and that uh, the momentum obviously determines the outcome. So um, I'm going to wrap up here. And uh, I guess there are a couple of different ways forward uh, w with this type of research. One thing that I would like to do clearly is to have uh, a greater uh, empirical handle on the, uh, the question about what, do hierarchical or diverse societies actually 
um, manage their resources uh, more extravagantly or, or more poor, or poorly in comparison to homogeneous or egalitarian ones. And I don't, obviously my data don't directly address that, uh, but that can be found. Uh, then the second thing is, of course, how can we, given the fact that the world is filled with diverse and hierarchical societies, how can we work with that fact and change the games that people play when they're interacting with their resources and with each other, such that um, we are encouraging them to A, share, and be cooperative, and B, conserve. Um, and so I think the nice thing about this is that some of these same methods can be used to answer these questions. Um, so thank you. <laughs>